This episode is made possible by generous contributions from Joan M. Bruderer, in memory of her father Albert, her mother Anne, and her brother Bob, and the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize Jr., and Bank of America trustees. Step back into Kansas City's past. Meet the innovators and achievers who left their mark on our town and the nation. This week, Crosby interviews William Shakespeare, history's greatest writer, poet, and chronicler of the human condition. For the first time in 400 years, the author of our language, William Shakespeare. Shakespeare, good morrow. Good morrow. And welcome to our stage. Uh, d- uh, mm, mm, I'm sorry, uh, what? Our stage, our stage. Our, our stage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, stage. There you go. Yes, sir. I call you, there's a stage. Well, uh, I'm, I, I, forgive me, sir, but I have trod many stages in my day, and I assure you, this is no stage. And. <laughs> This is no playhouse. I, I see no, uh, no painted scenery, no uh, tears of galleries, no tiring house, no bottles of ale for groundlings. Oh, no groundlings. Uh, everyone seems to be sitting in a chair. Uh, well, we are either at court or your new stages are for the wealthy who can afford to pay the extra penny for a chair. Well done. Uh, you know, uh, for another penny, you might have had a cushion for that seat. They have cushions on them. Really? Yeah. And, uh, for f- free? Unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, you addressed me by my uh, Christian name, sir. Uh, have we an acquaintance? Well, we all, we all know you a bit, Mr. Shakespeare. We know many things about you, in fact. We know that in 1599, in your 35th year, uh, in the reign, late in the reign of the great Queen Elizabeth, uh, you wrote a play called As You Like It. And in that play, a wonderful character, Jaques, Jaques talks about the seven ages of man. He was Jaques. He was a cynic, wasn't he? A melancholy man. So let's go through these seven ages of man because you played many parts, mm-hmm. perhaps all these parts, Literally, because you began your life, your career, your, uh, your work as an actor. Oh, yes, and I thank heaven for it. Well, to, to be in London, to, to, to play in the houses of the great, to play in playhouses spacious enough to, to contain the entire population and more of Stratford, to play before the queen and before the king. It was devoutly to be wished. And what prospects, pray, awaited me in Stratford? I might have uh, continued on as an apprentice to my father, who was a very fine glover and wit hour. A what hour? (laughs) A wit hour, sir. Uh, An artisan who works with soft and white leathers. Uh, Pray, patience, Goodman Dow. Uh, Or I uh, might have followed my father into municipal life and become, eventually like him, a high bailiff of Stratford-on-Avon. But I was called to a different pilgrimage. And your pilgrimage took you to, to London, to the theater, and to acting. Yes, uh, where I acted in, in the wonderful, wonderful plays of Christopher Marlowe, who was, in his time, the only man of the English theater. And, and you were soon writing your own parts, mm-hmm. sometimes with other men, but uh, eventually you became a playwright. Yes, I discovered I had some small talent for it. <laughs> and I could, uh, I could pocket 10 pounds for a good one. Playwriting at that time, as well as certainly acting, playing itself, uh, was a pretty dubious uh, occupation. In fact, there was a, 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 a preacher who shortly before you got to London said, the cause of sin are plays. <laughs> and, and, and then Ben Johnson, your, who became your great friend and competitor as a playwright and a poet, he killed an actor yes. who himself had killed an actor. Yes. Sounds kind of dangerous. Yes. 
Uh, my favorite story, actually, about the dangers of all this, uh, it, it really hits home here, is Robert Dawes, who, who doubled as a gatherer, that is a ticket taker in our, our contemporary terms, who killed a patron who had dared to argue over the price of admission, something that does occasionally happen here. <laughs> Zeus. This is a, it was a tricky business even for playgoers, apparently. Oh, yeah, and then, of course, uh, poor Kit Marlowe, who was stabbed to death in a tavern in Deptford. Oh, what a tragic waste that was. What he might have accomplished, what he might have become, what he might have produced had he survived. Of course, uh, then he would have been more competition for me, but... Uh, no, that's all one. It would have been well, well worth it. But, but you lived in a time when sedition and heresy mm. uh, was looked for everywhere, and indeed Ben Jonson himself was jailed uh, for his play, The, the Isle, Isle of Dogs. Dogs. Yes, a dog's breakfast was more like. Uh, you were practically the only poet or playwright who was not censured, fined, or jailed. Well, I was friends with fortune and the law. I was the queen's man, and then I was the king's man. I, uh, I was loyal to crown and church. But you don't always show kings and princes to advantage. In fact, many of your great characters are tyrants. Oh, yes, well, many of them were. were they? <laughs> Indeed. And your early history plays were, were really a history of the, of the English monarchy mm -hmm. with the claims to the throne, good and bad. Yes, uh, the first part of my Henry IV was probably my most popular play. It had Jack Falstaff, uh, Prince Hal, uh, Hotspur, a wonderful trio of rogues to conjure with. I want to talk about Richard II, which came before Henry IV. Yes, and it was William the Conqueror who brought them all to life. <laughs> well, well that, that actually reminds me of a story about you, a kind of scurrilous story that I oh, want to tell yeah. you, I want you to tell us if, if it's true. So it is said that Richard Burbage, your partner mm. and the great actor who played many of your, your great roles, mm. Julius Caesar, Macbeth, Hamlet, etc., that one night after Richard III, after playing Richard III, he'd made an assignation uh, with a young lady, and it was overheard by someone. And by the time he got to the young lady's apartment and knocked on the door and said, it's Richard III, inside the room it came back, William the Conqueror came before Richard III. Now, <laughs> can this be true? Discretion is the better part of valor, sir. <laughs> what can be true may be false. Okay, well, obviously we're not going to get an answer to that one. But in Richard II, you do show a pathetic deposition and death of a king. And this is trouble with... <laughs> yes, and I'm fully aware of that, sir. I did write the thing. Yes. So, uh, trouble with Queen Elizabeth, I would expect. Oh, no, 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 no. No, no, sir. No, no, not me, not, not the company. Now, after the investigation into the Earl of Essex uh, rebellion, uh, the, the Chamberlain's men were found completely innocent of any wrongdoing in that affair. As a matter of fact, we played at court shortly after. Reportedly, the Queen once told the court here, do you not know that I am Richard II? The tragedy was acted out 40 times in the open streets, which wasn't true, of course, but still one could feel the scaffold nearby. And, and, and Bolingbroke, who um, deposed Richard II, uh, later became King Henry IV, who was a model for any budding usurpists. I, I, I played Bolingbroke in a school play. Is, <laughs> is it even so? Yes. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, odd, because I, I would have had you play the fool. <laughs> 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 Much like... Uh, much like Will Kemp. Uh, hold, 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 hold. Kemp? Kemper? <laughs> Why, sir, are you the fair issue of a distinguished line of clowns? <laughs> Bankers and librarians, sir. <laughs> but you're occasionally confused. With but let's go back for a second to Stratford and to your education. I understand where the interest in the history of England in Tudor and Stuart times comes for you, for any, any boy who uh, m might be interested in the theater. But I wonder where that whining schoolboy... His shining morning face. His shining morning face <laughs> turned into the lover 
and the poet and the judge <laughs> and the philosopher and the man of imagination. There are more things in our stars than are dreamt of in your philosophy, Mr. Kempa. Stop quoting yourself. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry. It's, it's irresistible. <laughs> no, Stratford, uh, my mother was an Arden, who was a prominent family. My father, John Shakespeare, was a gentleman and had a coat of arms to prove it. Well, there are many gentlemen, many a gentleman, including poets and playwrights, including the poets and playwrights of your time, mm -hmm. uh, men who became your friends or your competitors or both, Nash, Lilly, Green, Marlowe, aspired to more of an education. Uh, uh, they, they called themselves the university wits. Many of them, most of them had gone to Oxford and Cambridge. You had only gone to a grammar school, and Ben Jonson famously said of you, little Latin and less Greek. Oh, God's blood. Oh, Johnson, Johnson. Ben Jonson, a man whose much vaunted learning hangs like bunting from every word. Indeed, he did not, in fact, uh, go to university. Uh, he, his trade was as a bricklayer. Do you know, in my last year of life, he published his writings in a very, very handsome volume with a rather pugnacious title, Works, with an E, no less. Uh, W-O-R-K-E-S, -O -O -E Works. <laughs> For all his learning, he seems to have lost the ability to distinguish between work and play. Your plays, particularly the comedies and the, the late romances, are all about transformation. Mm -hmm. Women dressing as men, changelings, mistaken twins, magic potions leading to total inversions of behavior. Yes, and uh, and uh, at least one of them was a complete ass. <laughs> And, and one really? was it? Really? Uh, no more? No more than that? Right. Uh, and at least, all right. Who knows what play I was just referencing? Bottom. What? 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 What was it? Midsummer Night's Dream. Yes. Oh, you're listening. Wonderful. And you know my work. I forgive you all. <laughs> Please continue. And, 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 and at least one of those characters was a statue who remained a statue for many years. Oh but yes, but she. Uh, came gloriously to life, which was a further transformation. So can you explain how you traveled the distance from the verities of your history plays to the mythical and fantastic imaginaries of the comedies and the late romances? Hmm. Well, as a, as a child, uh, I, uh, I heard the stories of the fairies and the goblins and ghosts. And You see, um, Stratford bordered on the Forest of Arden, and uh, as a child, I was convinced that all the ghosts and goblins and fairies dwelt in there. Uh, to this day, whenever I think of uh, Ariel or Puck or Caliban or even a ghost of Hamlet's father, I think of them as inhabiting that forest. And in, in, as you were a boy and grow, growing up in Stratford, there were troops of actors, were there not? To the beginning of the troops of actors who would leave London and come through the provinces, come through Warwickshire, your, 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 your county, and visit the great houses, and also the Queen's progresses, uh, right. pageants really, coming, coming through Warwickshire. That must have been a sight to see and very stimulating oh, to a young yes, imaginative oh, God, boy. yes, of course. Oh, the, it, it was wonderful. It, it was life-changing. Of course, at the time, they weren't quite on the caliber of the Chamberlain's men or the King's men or even the Admiral's men or the Rose, but English theatre was about to go through a time of immense growth and development. And at that, but at that time, well, it, it may have been rough magic, but it was still magic. It's the, Traveling troops of players would wend their way through the wilderness of Warwickshire and uh, other counties, usually to avoid the plague, which uh, came and went every few years in those days, so, or to avoid uh, the Puritans, who uh, were their own sort of plague. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you married, and uh, you married, and then had your first child <clears throat> seven months later. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> And, and was there, uh, you joined these troops and went, went off to, to, to London, was there no thought of your wife? <laughs> what? You beef-witted adult of course. <laughs> of course there was a thought of my wife. Uh, Anne and I 
my, Anne Hathaway, my wife, uh, had a large family on both sides. So uh, in my absence, the, my, uh, my wife and my three children were very well looked after. Thank you very much. Anne was a few years older than me. And uh, she was already uh, in, her, in her prime. And I was youthful and adventurous. And so we each had our part to play. But surely there was a strain on your marriage if you disappeared to London for 20 years. <laughs> The marriage of true minds admits no impediment, sir. But she was... And the course of true love never did run smooth. Enough with your poetry. Oh, enough with my poetry? Now go to, you whinging jackanapes, go to. Enough with my poetry, I am a poet, sir. What would you have me do? And a poet of some renown, I'll have you know. Uh, have, you, have you not read my Venus and Adonis? My Rape of Lucrece? Yes. They've gone through six uh, editions each. Uh, I, I am held in as high esteem as any poet of my time. Spencer or Sidney or, or uh, Marlowe or Johnson or Dunn. Dunn, sir? Are you done, sir, with this line of questioning? Not, yeah, because I, I am done, I sir. Be. Yes. Oh, well, enough of your poetry, indeed. Let's talk of kings and clowns. Oh, yes, for God's sake. <laughs> Let us... Sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings, how some have been deposed, some slain in wars, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, all murdered. For within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of the king keeps death his state. And there the antic sits, scoffing his state, grinning at his pomp, allowing him a breath, a little scene to monarchize. Oh, please, there, yes, yes. So it, it, please don't hesitate to unburden yourself of your appreciation. So it, it, it's interesting that you, you talk about, in, in, in that, that uh, uh, moment from Richard II, about uh, the scene. Mm. And, and it, it's as if the monarchy itself is a theater. Uh, and, 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 and you're telling the sad stories of kings, but in all of these plays, you seem to always have the other side of the story. You seem to have the clown. You seem to have Festy or Touchtone, or in Lear, you've got the fool it himself, called the fool. Yeah. Um, you know, our little lives, whether they be as, uh, as groundlings or as monarchs, are but insubstantial pageants, are they not? The, our, our English audiences, were fiercely loyal both to the monarch and to the nation. Uh, Henry V was my most popular character. Well, always, of course, accepting John Falstaff, uh, but Henry V was one of the most popular characters, and especially as it was played by uh, Richard Burbage, who was a, a marvelous actor, prodigiously talented. Uh, once more into the breach, uh, cry God for Harry, England, and St. George. Uh, the Harfleur speech, you yourself, you, know, you talked about Henry V being, being uh, uh, your greatest character except for Falstaff, but in Henry V, off stage, but as a result of, well, anyway, you, you kill him off, you kill Falstaff off. Yes, yes, well. Well, well uh, Falstaff, as played, uh, or rather overplayed by our own Will Kemp, our clown, and, and your venerated forebear, uh, Falstaff and Kemp uh, threatened to become bigger than the globe itself. Well, Hamlet's advice to the players, it seems, might be appropriate here. Well, the, the bit about the sawing of the air. Yes. Oh, uh, even more appropriate. Uh, um, let those that play your clowns speak no more than is set down for them. <laughs> yes. Well, Kemp was forever breaking into jigs uh, for hours at a time at the end of plays. And, and he started doing it at the end of scenes. So we, we parted ways. I wanted to hold the mirror up to nature, and he wanted to make the unskillful laugh and the judicious grieve. So we, we had to let them go, both of them, both uh, Sir John Falstaff and Will Kemp. Uh, another, uh, another moment uh, in your career, not only as actor but, and playwright, but as owner, mm -hmm. um, James Burbage, the father of your partner and great actor, fellow actor, Richard. fellow sharer, sharer, Richard Burbage, 
had built one of the first theaters in London called, actually, remarkably, The Theater. <laughs> the Theater. <laughs> Can you imagine the, the, the presumption, the arrogance? It was wonderful. But we called uh, our new theater The Globe. But why, why not stay at the theater? Why go to the Globe? Ah, uh, well, thereby hangs a tale. Um, well, you see, um, James Burbage had uh, recently died. and He died a uh, broken bankrupt, and he lost the lease on the land. Uh, but we, the company, owned the actual building that uh, sat upon the land. Uh, and so um, Cuthbert uh, Burbage, Cuthbert Burbage, uh, approached the landlord to renew the lease, but the landlord was strangely difficult and evasive. Uh, very likely he had other plans uh, for the plot of land and the building that uh, sat upon it. Uh, very likely something on the order of uh, fencing or bear baiting or some other rich, rich entertainment such as that. Uh, but uh, yes, the, the, the tale, the legend. Uh, well, we had had enough. And so, so the, so the tale goes, uh, one uh, cold, dark December night when the landlord was out in the, in the counties for uh, Christmas holidays, we assembled, we, the Chamberlain's men, assembled at the theater along with a contingent of uh, paid workers, hired workers, and we dismantled the theater building and carted it in pieces across the frozen Thames to another plot in Southwark, uh, not far from the Rose. And there we remantled it, if you will, and uh, called it the globe. And according to the story, this was all the work of a single night. Well, of course, of course it wasn't. I mean, it took much longer than that. We did have to move quickly, however, because uh, the queen had required us to appear at court uh, to perform Midsummer Night's Dream at Shrovetide. Well, let's talk about your last decade. In fact, let's talk about your last year, 1616. You drew up a will. Mm -hmm. A will. And it has some relation to that division of the kingdom that Lear makes. King Lear divides his kingdom in at the beginning yeah. of the play. It should yes, be said. well, I, in, I do have daughters, if that's your meaning. Well, you divided your estate, as did Lear, unequally between them. Yes, but I, I didn't force them to be rivals for my love. So no sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child. No, 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 certainly not. Well, no, the closest thing I had to contend with in the way of a thankless child was my youngest daughter, Judith's horsen, beetle-headed, flap-eared, son of a mongrel bitch, knave of a husband, quining. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. Um, He's still got it. <laughs> yes, I, uh, he was reason enough for me to draw my will in a different direction. So you, you, you also left something to your sharers, your mm -hmm. partners, uh, John Hemmings and Henry Condal. Yes, yes uh, 26 shillings uh, for commemorative rings, as, as was the custom. And, and Hemmings and Condal did more than commemorate you with the rings. They put together a folio of your 36 plays. Mm. We have one upstairs, a real one, yes, shortly. Uh, uh, yes, you, you mentioned that a before. Copy, a, copy, a copy here. It was a lovely, lovely thing to do. You know, I count myself in nothing so happy as in the memory of good friends. You know, a folio. And you say you have one in your attic. We, we have, we, yes, what in the, the attic. Well, hold, hold, the hold, attic hold, upstairs. hold, hold, hold. Uh, did you say 36 plays? Well, that's well, the... What happened to the others? I, I think they were lost. Lost? Yes. Oh, no. What, the, uh, what uh, Love's Labor's Love's, Lost? We, we have that. Oh, good. Uh, Love's Labor's Found? We haven't found that. No. <laughs> oh, what a shame. That was a wonderful play. It was very we're, popular. We're all still looking, believe me. Good, good. Well, so now I, 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 want, I, I want to look back. I want you to look back over your career, and I want you to... Uh, to tell me what you think your epitaph should be. Oh. Well, we're there already, are we? <laughs> we are indeed. Mm, very well. Mm. well. My epitaph. Well, um, I think as I've been given a choice, I should, uh, I should prefer two epitaphs. Uh, one, my player's epitaph, uh, hopefully 
carved in stone in some theater, uh, might be something along the lines of uh, Prospero's epilogue. Uh, it is now in the hands of the audience, either to blow me back to, my, to Naples, to my library in Stratford, or to send me out around and around the great globe itself. And uh, my other epitaph, my life's epitaph, the one over my bones, I think I should simply like it to be William Shakespeare, gentleman. And so, Mr. Shakespeare, I would like to end with Ben Jonson's epitaph for you in the first folio, that you were not merely the soul of the age, but for all time. Ladies and gentlemen, William Shakespeare. This is the first time I've ever portrayed William Shakespeare, uh, and uh, it was quite a challenge. One of the most interesting things about it was the fact that uh, so little is actually known. He writes for the soul of the human being, and, and he writes of what it is to be a human. I understand Shakespeare did go to Independence. Maybe it was Sedalia. I think he was looking for a, for a Goober Burger. Oh, there you go. He decided at the Wheel Inn. <laughs> This episode is made possible by generous contributions from Joan M. Bruderer in memory of her father, Albert, her mother, Anne, and her brother, Bob, and the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize, Jr., and Bank of America trustees. 